So this coming Sunday, we'll start Passion Week, uh, otherwise known as the, I call it the tearful entry. Some services will call it the triumphal entry, but we're gonna call it the tearful entry. Thank you. All right. So we're going to look at the people, places, and events around the most important death in human history. And the converse of that is Christmas time would be the most important birth in history, right? So we have two ends of the spectrum, but we're going to concentrate on the unfortunate part of it or the fortunate departing, depending on your point of view. So anyway, I said the tearful entry. Um, Jesus wept on the way in. Do you think anybody noticed that? I don't know. They were all pretty happy about it, right? If you look for um, hosannas and palms, you won't find any of that in the book of Luke. Not a single mention. The women wept along the way as he was going towards his cross. Peter wept that night. I hate to say that Judas wept that night. And the women who wept on his way out to uh, the cross, they probably wept at their own state as they waited for unknown what was going to take place. Their savior had just died. I've wept. You've wept. So while you can call it a triumphal entry, Jesus was probably very sad the fact that they missed it. They missed Daniel 9. They missed Zechariah 9, 9. So he was tearful of the fact that he, they missed it. They wanted that physical king. That's what they were after. They had no idea who it was that they were laying their cloaks in front of. So we're going to go through some of this. So we're going to make nine stops real quick. And um, I marked them off there for you so we can keep track of where we are. Um, Number one on our slide, we did not know exact location of the upper room. But um, that's position approximate, as we would say uh, when we're out sailing, right, David? Position approximate. Uh, the next stop is uh, number two. We have a scriptural event here while crossing the Kidron Valley. And actually, last time we spoke together, I was here, we talked about the Passover. And one of the things we went through was, the last thing we went through was, this is where Peter boasts that um, no matter what happens, he will not deny Christ. And Jesus checks him on that and says, You'll, you'll deny me twice before the cock crows. So, three times before the cock crows twice. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get your twos and threes straightened out. Uh, number three, I think this is one of the most amazing things for me. I think this is one of those miracles that people don't talk about enough. I've spent a little bit of time in here. Um, we have some sleeping disciples. We have the betrayal by Judas. And I like the way John portrays it. Jesus, as soon as the crowd comes forward for him, Jesus steps forward and says, whom do you seek? And the soldiers say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am he. And they all fall back. Pretty amazing. All right. Now, you got to imagine two things that have taking place here. One, and the next thing that happens is Peter cuts off Malchus's ear. It doesn't say what Jesus did. It just says he restored it. Doesn't say he picked it up. Doesn't say he did anything bad. But I promise you that if Jesus restored your ear... You didn't even know it was even cut off, right? It's perfect. So if you were there, unbeknownst to you, not really too sure who Jesus was, you have to realize, or you're a soldier, this is somebody who's pretty special. We all just fell back, and he just put that guy's ear back on. <laughs> and it's one of those things. I mean, I don't think I've ever been to a service where we talked about the miracle of Jesus putting this guy's ear back on there. So to me, that's pretty incredible. So if you didn't know who he was before then, you certainly have to stop and give pause for the fact of who he was you're facing in front of. All right, so next stop. House of High Priests, mocked and beaten his first trial. This is uh, visiting at Annas' house. This is where he lived. He was the high priest from 6 through 15 AD. Um, but this night sees us as about 15 years later, and he's no longer a high priest. Matter of fact, the uh, Rome removed him, but he still had considerable power. Caiaphas, head of the Sanhedrin. 
and get rid of these papers. All right, interesting, we get a little bit of a timeline here because the Sanhedrin was not allowed to meet before sunup. So this is somewhere between maybe 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. This is his second trial. And this is, um, Caiaphas says something very prophetic here. So let's go to John 11 and look at this. So contextually, uh, the entire chapter of uh, John 11 has to deal with Lazarus. So whether he's sick, Jesus is, comes to see him, he dies, and he gets raised from the dead. We're going to pick it up in verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary, but Jesus had just called him out of the grave. Then the many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seeing the things Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went away and went and tattled to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nations. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not for the whole nation that they should perish. So he's being incredibly prophetic there. It's, he's basically spoken the central doctrine of the Christian faith in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And he didn't even know it. So you have a man speaking who had no idea what he was going to say. And Lazarus died in about 30 A.D., and if you, I'm a Jesus second or third century birth, this would be 33 A.D. So what Caiaphas spoke was perhaps three years before it actually took place. Next stop, Pilate, um, go before Pilate, and not stop number six. So Pilate and Jesus, and they, could, they are at the praetorium, but they are not in the praetorium. The Jews did not go into the praetorium as, or the Roman headquarters, as this was the dwelling place of the Gentiles. And should they have gone in there, they would be unclean for Passover. So Pilate came out to them. In that discourse, Pilate asked his famous question, what is truth? In John 18, 38, what is truth? And he said, he had said to this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. So our next stop before Pilate. So Pilate hears that Jesus is a Galilean and tries to unload this problem on Herod, whose jurisdiction was, was Galilee. Herod was hoping that Jesus would do a miracle for him, so he was glad to have Jesus before him. Herod plays 20 questions with Jesus, and Jesus answered him not a single word. So feeling like the whole thing was just a big joke, he treated it with amusement and sent Herod back to Pilate. So back in front of Pilate, so stop number eight. Um, Pilate passes judgment on Jesus and he is scourged. All those who were crucified were scourged, but not all those who were scourged were crucified. There's a group of men inside this people who would scourge people. They were like the all-stars, if you were. They would notch their belts on the people that they could kill. A lot of people died from the scourging before they were ever crucified. Pretty sad. So that was his last stop for, before Gal Golgotha. And I'm gonna, there's something that took place here that we're going to skip for a minute, but I'm going to come back to. Okay? So we'll be coming back to this spot. And then our last stop here, it's about six-tenths of a mile from the Praetorium to Golgotha. And we're going to stop here from our little map. And now we're going to take into, jump into some of the people that were there. No, actually, I want to do this first. The crucifixion has a lot of... 
erroneously uh, titled art to it. And I had another word there. Sorry about that. But this is not the way you were crucified. You were not six feet in the air. And, that, and there's another one where they actually have ladders where they're trying to get the guy up on there and trying to do ladders. This is not what this is all about. As a matter of fact, and I put a black box around that one. Uh, Michelle and I were in a church two years ago this month. And it was a half round church. You walk in there and the ceiling was just soaring. It probably went up 30, 40 feet. They had the single largest crucifix with Jesus on it that I have ever seen in my life. And it looked exactly like that. But that's not the way it looks. I have a handout. And you can have it at later, and it's also, we're going to put it online, we'll link it to this, but it's called The Science of the Crucifixion. It's written by a lady who's a Christian, she's a doctor, and she goes through all the physiology of crucifixion. It's really incredible what it is that you have to go through when, you, when you're crucified. And if this looks different than what you normally see, it's because this is the reality of the way you were actually crucified. You were only two, maybe three feet off the ground, your feet. What happened was they throw you back on your back. They nail your arms to the patibulum. That's what the cross member is. Jesus probably did not carry the whole cross. The patibulum, if you take a standard piece of lumber that we have dimensional lumber now, a six by six, and say it's maybe six feet long, it weighs 8.1 pounds per foot. So that one stick of lumber would have weighed 50 pounds. Um, It'd be hard enough for you or I to carry that a half a mile, much less somebody who has just been scourged. And even though Jesus was in really good shape, it'd be hard pressed to do that. Plus your body's in shock. And if it looks like it's funny because of the way they are, they actually purposely have your feet up close and your legs at 90 degrees because they want your body to be caved in like that. What happens is your body, if you've held your arms out long enough, your arms start to quiver, your muscles start to quiver. Then they get cramps in them, and then they finally let go because your body can't do anything. So now you're falling down. In some cases, your uh, socket, your shoulders, and or your elbows come out of their sockets, so you can't even pull yourself up any more longer. You see, it's all twisted over. It's not that you can't inhale. It's that you can't exhale. So what happens is you have all this carbon dioxide in your body, and now your blood gases are completely out of whack. So you go into all kinds of heart issues and lung issues. So again, it's all in that handout there. I won't go into all that. I didn't want to get into the gruesomeness of it. It is an incredibly gruesome thing. Didn't want to go there. Darren, I need to go back to that one slide. Oh my gosh. Okay. So the crucifixion. Obviously, Jesus is the prime character, but during our time together, I want to deal with just some of the particulars. And we often think about who he was, the how and why he went to the cross, and what it cost him, and how it impacts our lives, and it does tremendously. It's the single most important death in human history, and every fact that we can uncover brings us to a fuller understanding. So again, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on the crucifixion, but it's important to recall some of this. And I want to get some of the idea behind the physiology and aspects of the torture of his death. Um, We're going to walk quickly through. I already did that, but the Gospels, the writers of the Gospels did not make a big deal about this at all. For them, he simply died. There's no notice of, uh, there's no explanation of the crucifixion in any of the gospels. Jesus himself and the apostles knew full well the horrors of what would take place. And the part that grieved him most would be that his father, the God of the universe, would turn his back on him. We cannot even comprehend or process that. Since my salvation, I have never ever felt he was not present during anything that I was going through. Partly because his word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when darkness fell over the land, it was as if the light of the world had been extinguished. So the type of cross that he was crucified on was called a tau. Uh, That's a Greek letter and appears much like our uppercase T. So that's the way that was. And I said before, the vertical member is called the patibulum. The part that was in the ground and stayed in the ground was called the stipes. 
It's like uh, stripes without the R, stripes. <coughs> I got way ahead of myself. All right. So the crucifixion was invented by the, by the Persians and perfected by the Romans, and it remains the single most brutal and painful way to die ever conceived. Um, they nailed you to the patibulum. They pick you up, so now you're hanging by the two nails, fasten you to the stipes, the vertical member, so let's step back and from Jesus' journey that night and meet our first of several players. All right, first is Simon of Cyrene. Uh, Cyrene is a North African port that would be in modern-day Libya. It was a fairly large Jewish population. And Simon was probably there for Passover and simply walking through town, passing through town. Simon is mentioned in three times in the Gospels, uh, Matthew 27, Mark 15 and Luke 23, all having to do with this subject of carrying the cross. So let's go to Mark 15, 21. Mark 15, 21. Now they compelled, I like that word, now they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear Jesus' cross. So therefore, Alexander and Rufus, well, Mark's gospel was written some years later after the crucifixion. And Simon mentioned the father of Alexander and Rufus. So if this is 33 AD and Mark was written about 50 AD, so we have about a 20 year span there. So it'd be plausible to say that um, Alexander and Rufus were known by Mark, by Mark's readers. Um, there's also a tradition that the Rufus mentioned in Mark 15, 21 is the same Rufus mentioned in Romans 16, 13. Let's go there real quick. Sixteen thirteen. So in Romans here, we have Paul's personal greetings, his swan song, basically. He's thanking and greeting everybody that ever helped him, um, concludes with his admonition and his benediction. But in 13, it says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. All right, that was kind of an odd translation there, so I looked that up, and a more understandable reference would be I have that. <coughs> yep. Greet Rufus, chosen the Lord, and his mother, and his mother, and been a mother to me as well. So something that he's just saying out that Rufus's mother was like a mother to him. So circumstantially, we can hypothesize that Simon and his family were Christians. If this is the case, then it would lend credence to the idea that Simon and his family were prominent in the early church. However, Scripture nowhere explicitly makes this connection between the two Rufuses. So with anything and everything we actually know about Simon who carried his cross is summed up in the verse we looked at in Mark 15, 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and he was coming out of the country, passing by to bear his cross. So his human strength is waning. Jesus handed the physical or the human weight to a man, but moves ahead of Simon and conquers death and resurrection in his divine strength. It was his divine strength that Jesus displayed that day. Simon was pulled in to walk the walk, but Jesus led the way. And that's the way it is when we bear our cross. Jesus is always going before us. Luke says it this way in Luke 23, 26. Now as they led him away... They laid hold of certain man, Simon I Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So again, Jesus leads the way. We have to go behind that. 
So we too are to carry our cross, and when we're burdened, to make sure that Jesus is out in front, leading and guiding the way. So now Jesus is on the cross, so let's visit another player, the penitent thief on the cross. Uh, first of all, it says they were thieves. These guys were not thieves. Uh, thievery was not a capital crime. And I looked it up, and thieves in a concordance in our English translation can be the word thief, but there's an emphasis is that they were violent criminals, and I'll hypothesize them as being insurrectionists in a minute. So about 10 years ago, I met this thief on the cross. Uh, not physically, obviously, but I had a spiritual heartfelt longing to know more about him. He represented everything that runs counter to the Romanism that I grew up in, and even the post-realization that it was just another religion. And I still walked for years before being saved, thinking I had to get things turned around on my own. This guy had no chance to do any apologies, no restitution, no sacraments, no penance, no nothing. I spent weeks where I could not get this guy out of my mind, simply surrendering knowing who he was and the realization of who Jesus is. And that's all we can do. Then, some months later, in a reference book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, I actually found his name. His name was actually recorded. His name was Decimus. So if you write that down, if you walk out of here tonight and you have the name of Decimus and you can go tell somebody you know the name of the thief on the cross, you'll be far ahead of 99.999% of the people on the face of the earth. Because I've never run into anybody who knew that at all. And I have another handout. His name was Decimus. Uh, I wrote this four or five years ago. It's a good paper. You, this is, now is a good time when you can um, start up a conversation with somebody, kind of move into this, and if you give that piece of paper or you can email it to them, I still hand it out. It'll, even if they're a make-believer, it's going to challenge them. It'll get them lost, and in the end, they'll get the gospel. So it's a great thing. And my name's not on it, and the church is not on there, so you can spread it far and wide. I don't care. So Dismiss is on my top spot on who I want to meet when I go to heaven. I know that may sound weird, but who he is and how he fits in the crucifixion, for me, was a real revelation, but that's me. Dismiss has been and sort of continues to be a huge part of my life in Jesus, within Jesus Christ. I don't deify him. It's just that I spent so many hours thinking about somebody and how they fit in as part of the salvation experience. And for me, it was very impactful. So hanging there, he receives the ultimate pardon. Well, okay, not a pardon. He receives the ultimate gift. Let's look at Luke, Luke 23. Luke 23. Twenty-three thirty-nine. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But Decimus, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received our due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then Decimus said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. All right. Notice in verse 32, he said, he did not say paradise or heaven, he said kingdom. Mere conjecture on my part, but for him to use the word kingdom, I surmise that Decimus has been around and heard Jesus speak of kingdom a kingdom not of this world, for him to use that word for me implies that Jesus, he heard Jesus more than once. Again, that's just my humble opinion. So here we have the entire gospel of sorts, if you want, right here between 49 and 30, 43, in 92 words. And like your call on mine to repentance, it's one-on-one. -on -one. For Decimus and Jesus, it was one-on-one. -on -one. But imagine the war that went on in Decimus' head now that Jesus has died. He's hanging there. He's alive. 
Satan is going to be all over him. Kingdom, paradise, you got to be kidding me. You did this and this and this. Imagine what, you're not going to heaven. You're coming with me today. Just go ahead and spit on him and curse him like your buddy over there did. But if Jesus says you're going to be in paradise with him today, that's where you're going. If you're going to go across the lake in the boat, you're going across, no matter what happens in between, right? <laughs> All right. Jesus did not live long enough to, but Dismas did live long enough to get his legs broken. So you can imagine you're there, you're just a couple feet off the ground. You're hanging out like this, your head's probably down, but it's on about a hill. So you see some motion and you look up there and you see that guy coming. Big soldier, he's carrying a big club. He's got one of those very slow but steep, interesting, um, exacting steps. He's coming for you. You know what's going to happen. So you close your eyes, and he swings back, and he's swinging for the fences, and you just hope you pass out from the pain. You know how it is when you just bark your shins, how bad that hurts? Can you imagine some guy's going to swing at you with a club and break your legs? So hopefully you just pass out from the pain, and then you just die of asphyxiation, because that's what basically would have happened. And if he was swinging at you forward, that's one thing, but if they swings at you sideways, you'd probably knock your feet off the stipes. And uh, I found a picture, I didn't bring it, of a body that they exhumed, a skeleton, as it were, that somebody who had been crucified, and he still had the nine-inch spike between, the two feet, between his feet. Amazing. So for me, I'm looking forward to meeting Decimus. So let's get to another player, Barabbas. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. And let me put that in context. Rome ruled with absolute power. The Jewish leaders have just killed what they thought was a political upstart in Jesus. And Rome was not unhappy about it at all. Jesus created a stir, and they didn't like his rallies. I don't mean to imply that's what they were. I'm trying to contextualize it for us. Jesus drew crowds, and Rome didn't like crowds. And the Jewish leaders did not like Jesus' crowds. Jesus was drawing big crowds, and Jesus was stepping all over them and calling them out. Barabbas was part of a group of zealots called the Sicarii. They were primarily but not exclusively Jews who were tired of the oppression of the Rome, of Romans, and they would en enact the ultimate solution by killing people. And not just Romans, but sympathetic Jews who are more about living large than being Jewish and living under the law. Many Jews sold out to, what the, to the Roman payroll. So the Sicarii would roll up behind a Roman official or soldier and kill him. And the same with sympathetic, high-ranking Jews. Matthew, the tax collector, would have been the kind of target in a Jew. A tax collector living off the backs of his own people. So they carried a knife called a sika, which is what that is right there. Hence the word sicari. I don't know how that all the suffix works that way, but it's called sicari. It's a small curved knife they could hide under their cloak. They would come up from behind, plunge it up behind you, curved blade up, pierce your heart. So you've heard of the word cloak and dagger? Well, there you go. So these men were terrorists. They were something called zealots, and they had real zeal for what it was they believed was right and what they were doing. So I looked up the word zealot, and it's one burning with zeal, a zealot jealous of any rival or sternly vict vict vindicating his control. So where do we know the word zealot from? In Luke and in Acts, both times on the lists of the, gospel, of the uh, disciples, Simon is listed second last, and Judas is listed last. Judas, we can surmise, was one of the Sicarii. Just conjecture on my part, we can't say for certain, but both times Judas is mentioned immediately following Simon the Zealot. And there's nothing casual or happenstance, happenstance about the single word in Scripture. So imagine Simon the Zealot and Matthew, a tax collector. That would be like somebody from Antifa and a crooked politician on the same softball team. So the extraordinary reality is, is the changed hearts of this group of men. So Jesus can change your heart to the point where you have a tax collector and a zealot on the same team. So back to Barabbas. So here we have a true insurrectionist. And again, conjecture on my part is that Barabbas, Dismas, and the other guy that was crucified that day were of the same ilk. 
that they were cohorts in crime as insurrectionists. Sakari, and they were simply scheduled to die together. Turn to Mark 15, 7. Mark 15, 7. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with fellow insurrectionists. They had committed murder in the insurrection. All right, so I'm not saying that there were two guys, three guys, or ten guys chained, but for me, it kind of works out to the fact that these three guys had all been captured in the insurrection. And if you look at the word, look up the word insurrection, it's um, a rebellion, it says there. It's insurrection or sedition. So for me, it was these three guys were our cohorts, and they were going to be crucified together, but obviously Barabbas got bought out. So if you can imagine, um, you remember 9-11, Zacharias Musawi? People remember that, okay? Um, many people in this country saw him as a hero, okay? Most of them were fundamentalist Muslims, and, and there was a very large faction at the time, being it was the fastest growing religion in the world. And even the Sunni and Shia Muslims came together on that day. And even some Americans who hate this country, what it stands for, were sympathetic to the cause of Musawi. So you can see how it was easy or easier for the leaders to whip up the crowd to be able to release Barabbas. So we've met some of the players in that day in the single most important death in human history. Obviously, Simon the Cyrene, Dismas the Penitent Thief, and Barabbas. Now, it'd be fair to say that Dismas holds first place for salvation. Based on Christ's atoning sacrifice that day, Jesus gave up his life for Dismas. But let's look at something. Remember I said I was going to go back to Pilate. Okay, so let's go back there. So Jesus is at the praetorium, standing before Pilate, and a good number of Roman soldiers, the high priest, and a crowd. Below the praetorium, and off to one side, are the prison cells, and they're carved out of limestone. So Barabbas is down there, and he wouldn't have heard Pilate's question. He wouldn't have heard Pilate said, which one of these people do you want me to give, to give, give you away, to give away? And they were saying, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas, Barabbas. So Barabbas would have heard that, and he's thinking, wow, this sounds pretty good. Maybe I won't die today. But he wouldn't have heard Pilate's second question. And Pilate's second question is, what do you want me to do with him, him being Jesus? And they all yell, crucify, crucify him, crucify. So now Barabbas is a little bit nervous because now he realizes he's going to be crucified. So he sits there and waits patiently. And he hears the Roman soldiers off in the distance coming their armor and their sandals uh, resonating off the walls and it gets louder and louder and louder. And a guard comes up to the gate, fiddles with the lock, opens the door, stares him right in the face and says, you can go free. Jesus paid your price. He died for you. Maybe Dismas wasn't the first one to be saved. I don't know for a fact. I'm just saying hypothetically. We don't know. Go to Luke 23, 23:46. Luke 23:46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what they had done, beat their breasts and returned. Many realized what they had done. Nobody ever died like this. No one ever cried out for forgiveness for the men who have done this to them. 
And again, when it got dark across the land, it was as if the light of the world had gone out. If you were there that day watching and you perhaps had followed Jesus and heard him teach, but you walked away because you wanted an earthly king, you realized what just took place. So you walked no more, as it said in John 6, 6. Seeing what they had done, they beat their breasts. But on the third day, he rose again. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Lord, Jesus, just transport us now back to the upper room, Lord. That's where this all started. Let us do as you charge, Lord, to do this in memory of me, Lord. So we thank you for the, for the communion elements that are before us, Lord. Just allow us to ponder these things, Lord. We don't know Barabbas saved. We don't know. We don't. So many things we don't know, Lord. We can only go by what your word says. That's the only thing we can hold on to, Lord. Is that is actually here in print, Lord. We can hypothesize and summarize and just conjecture, Lord. But all we can do is know that you died. You rose again for us, Lord Jesus. So we give you thanks and praise for that. In your name, amen. Pastor David's going to come up and play some little instrumental for us. If you are new, this is your first uh, communion with us. Um, we uncover the elements. You spend your time with the Lord getting things squared away as you need to. And then you come up and do it as your own, as, as led in your own time. <laughs>